if you have a look at this picture, you've got someone trying to nail nails into the sand, trying to delineate where the edge of the water is, but obviously the water is moving in and out. And you could argue, as this meme does here, that trying to use language to describe the universe is maybe a fool's errand because it's ultimately too complex for our language to get around. And this is an interesting question here is to what extent can the universe be described by human language or even just be comprehended by the human brain? And then from that, there's another question which kind of goes the other way around, which is how much is the human brain's understanding of the universe and the world limited by the language that we're trying to use to describe it? So today we're going to talk about this and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what people call the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, which has sort of two parts to it. We're going to talk about linguistic determinism and linguistic relativism. First of all, though, I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, this picture here is a man called John Quijada. So John Quijada uh, is an American man or a Mexican-American uh, who is a conlanger. So for a hobby, he creates languages for fun. So conlang is constructed languages. There's people out there that as a hobby or as an intellectual pursuit or like some kind of artistic pursuit, they create languages. And he had this idea right from when he was a young child. He was uh, really interested in this idea of having, uh, having a, a language that could explain everything that was completely unambiguous. 100% precise, but also very concise, no ambiguity, a really great method of communication in his mind, uh, but kind of as an artistic project. I don't know if he really expected people to try and speak this, and it was called Ithquil. Now, as I said, Ithquil is meant to be maximally precise, but also maximally concise. So all these concepts that he would use this language and it was meant to be completely, completely unambiguous. You would say specifically exactly what you meant and it would be completely clear. So it's kind of almost like a thought experiment he was doing. And so he published stuff about Ithquil and he put out there what he'd been working on. And it was interesting that some people really latched onto the idea uh, and he completely out of the blue got an invitation to come to a Congress that was uh, being held in the Russian Federation. Um, this is in the early 2000s. And so he was invited to this Congress um, and he and he was really intrigued to find all these people who had been learning his language, Ithquil, because uh, remember, this is an incredibly difficult language to get your head around. It's, it's a very, very unnatural language in a lot of ways. Uh, but there were these people who had learnt it and because it was meant to be extremely logical and ex extremely precise, a lot of these people were telling him, that they felt smarter and they felt more logical since they'd been learning his language. Uh, he later realised that some of them had some interest, let's say interesting ideas. Uh, one of the main guys in this group turned out to be a, a white supremacist, uh, and so part of his wanting to learn the language and to, uh, in his you know in his mind, make himself feel smarter was part of trying to elevate him and the other master members of the master race above the others by by improving how their brain worked by learning John Quijada's language. Now, there's an interesting question with that. Is that even possible? Can you make yourself smarter or more logical because you speak a particular language? Or, for example, there's a TED Talk you can find if you Google it up on the YouTubes about... Uh, there's a guy who had a TED Talk about... He, he was uh, saying that what language you spoke natively would affect how good you were at saving money. And there's a lot of there's a lot of ideas that people have thrown around with this. It's a, it's an idea that people, in a lot of ways, a lot of people really like this idea that your language will do something to the way you perceive the world. It'll, it'll affect the way that your brain uh, functions. So, the name Sapir Whorf, uh, it's named after two people. So we had a linguist, someone who studies languages, called Edward Sapir, and he had a student who was named Benjamin Lee Whorf. And uh, together, they never actually wrote something and put it on paper and said, this is the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. It's more that it's kind of the idea that through the body of work these two guys did, sort of if you summarize it all in a nutshell, you get the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. So uh, Edward Sapir had this quote, which kind of summarizes a lot of it. In his view, uh, no two languages are ever sufficiently similar 
to be considered as representing the same social reality. The worlds in which different societies live are distinct worlds, not merely the same world with different labels attached. So his idea was basically that your world or your view of the world is largely constructed by your language. He had a, he had a view that this was a very, very strong effect. Uh, and then in the same paper, it goes on to say, we see and hear and otherwise experience very largely as we do because the language habits of our community predispose certain choices of in interpretation. So let's sort of summarize this. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that they did was they were researching, for example, a lot of Native American languages. One of the languages that they researched a lot was Hopi, um, which is spoken in the, the deserts out in the, the West, like New Mexico, um, Arizona, sort of in that, towards that area, I think. I should have Googled that before, so I actually knew for, for definite. Um, and so they made claims about Hopi, uh, which we'll come back to later. And they also made some claims about uh, the languages spoken in the high Arctic. Uh, and one thing that people talk about a lot is this kind of this, this catchphrase that people know about Eskimo words for snow. It's a thing that people say where they say, well, you know that the Eskimos have 7 million words for snow because they live in the Arctic and they have, you know, they're dealing with snow on a daily basis. Therefore, they'll have lots and lots of words for snow. And this actually set off a whole other debate because this is kind of a thing that people just know, but then linguists will go, well, there's a couple of problems with this statement and they're still arguing about it decades later. I'll, I'll give you guys a link um, to an article. I know it's a Wikipedia article, but it sort of summarizes a lot of the stuff for it. Uh, the sort of things that people have argued, there's issues like, for example, you know, when people say Eskimo words for snow, there's an issue with the word Eskimo uh, that it's not really um, an, eth you know, it's not a polite word to use these days. Um, uh, the indigenous inhabitants of the far north don't really like being called Eskimos. Some would tell you it's straight up a racial slur. Uh, but also it could refer to lots of different groups. You've got the Inuits and they speak different versions of the Inuit language or languages. You've got, you know, the Yupik and the Aleuts and, and various people that live in Alaska. And so it's, okay, define Eskimo is the first issue. There's also the issue of define word. Uh, this is a complicated topic here, but, you know, another time I'll make a video that explains polysynthesis, uh, which in, in a nutshell is basically that you've got languages where you don't really, it's very hard to say this is a word on its own because you'll have uh, maybe a verb stem that means it is snowing and then you've got all these other parts that you add on to it, which might add today or uh, quickly or whatever, and it all just becomes one big long sentence word. And then so you say, well, then there's an infinite number of words for snow, but actually there's also an infinite number of words for drink or something else uh, because all of the sentences in this language are technically made of all these little particles and you can have an infinite number of words for it. So that was another issue. But anyway, so linguists have argued for a very long time, do uh, Eskimos or Inuit people uh, actually have millions of words for snow or is that kind of a misconception or is it, you know. Also their research on Hopi largely was sort of, based on a few things that turned out to be uh, misconceptions or some of their, the research they were basing their, their, their arguments on were a bit shoddy. Um, so it's sort of, it's sort of a, a debate that people have said, well, maybe a lot of what Sapir and Worf came up with was wrong. But on the other hand, it has created a lot of debate and it has actually started a line of thinking which might give us ideas for further experiments we can do that we'll find out what actually does happen. So let's, uh, let's actually sort of define this a bit more and think about it in more depth. Uh, the core premise is that language shapes our perception of reality. And if it shapes our perception of reality, then language will also affect our behaviour. And so going back to Sapir Whorf and their ideas, linguists then go, okay, so how do we prove is this true? Or how do we experiment? How do we design experiments to work out how true it is? And then also, is that entirely true or only partially true? How do we actually find the limits of how much this works or doesn't work? Maybe it's not true at all. So what's the answer to this? What have we actually found through our experimentation? The answer is we still don't really know. Many people have experimented. We still don't really have a definitive answer. 
But we've got some ideas. We've got some ideas. Let's first of all, we're going to break it down into sort of two levels, because it also depends on to what extent it's true. Uh, you might have uh, what is called strong sapir wolf or strong wolfianism, which is linguistic determinism. The idea of this is that your la native language restricts your thoughts. So it's a bit like this guy here. The red rope is his language. Uh, well, actually, the guy is my thoughts. Let's put it into those terms. The guy is my thoughts, but he has been tied up by my language. So this guy is basically my brain right now with my, uh, my, my, the thoughts that I want to have being tied up by the language I have to express them. So the idea that it actually restricts it. This level, like strong Wolfianism, strong Sapir Wolf linguistic determinism, is mostly discredited. There are some linguists who will still argue that, that it might exist, and there are some people who are into constructed languages who still experiment with it and still believe there is something to be found here. So, I mean, it's not been 100%. It's, I mean, obviously, it's very hard to disprove anything really anyway, but mostly discredited at the moment. So you break it down, you've got sort of the softer form, so weak Sapir Whorf, uh, which you call linguistic relativism. So the concept of this is not that your language is actually restricting you, it's more that it's a filter or like a lens through which that you're viewing the world. So there you go, there's a visual analogy for you. Looking at the mountain, the mountain looks different through the polarised lens of the sunnies. And the idea that maybe your language is like that. You're not actually changing what you're seeing, but you are sort of putting a filter on it, that there is some level of, you know. And this is the kind of one that people think might be true to some extent, but it's hard to prove, and it's hard to prove to what extent. It's also hard to disprove. There's a lot of discussion about this, and there's a lot of things that people have experimented with. The debate continues. There is also one other thing to remember in all of this. Like, people often talk about culture affecting your language. The problem is that your language is also affected by your culture. Um, so it kind of becomes a chicken and an egg thing. How do you prove that your language is influencing your view of the world as opposed to your view of the world influencing your language? And uh, you end up with a bit of a cycle. Now, because I know that some of you nerds will get annoyed by the chicken and the egg analogy and you go, well, obviously it's the chicken or whatever, I threw that in as well. Feel free to discuss that with your biology teacher. Um, not right now. Anyway, some of the things that people have experimented with, there's an interesting one that I think um, that there's an area that the way that we perceive colour seems to be influenced some, somewhat by linguistic um, relativism. Uh, for example, in English, English speakers will tend to say that they feel that red and pink are different basic colours. So, for example, in English, we have the word red and then blue, green, yellow, brown, black. They're the ones that we would think of as being our basic colour vocab. We also have words like scarlet and crimson, but we'd think of them as scarlet and crimson are types of red. We wouldn't think they're different colours. They're just a special kind of red. And then pink, though, is just light red, but we will insist it's a different colour. English speakers will tend to say it's a different colour. And some other languages might have the same word for blue and green, and they'll just say that blue and green are shades of the same thing. This is very common. Um, if you look on YouTube, there's a video with the somewhat misleading title the ancient Greeks couldn't see the colour blue or something like that. I forget exactly what it's called, but you'll find it if you, you Google that. Um, talking about this kind of thing, that um, in a lot of languages it's only very recent that they've had blue and green as different basic words and then talk about what effect that might have in how they talk about describing things. Uh, another interesting example is, uh, for example, in Russian, they kind of do the same thing with blue that in English we do with red. In Russian, sini uh, means like a really dark blue, Whereas Galaboy is like a light blue. And they will think of them as being two basic colours of their own. Like not one is a shade of the other, but actually separate colours. Um, and they did an experiment with this where they got English speakers and Russian speakers to basically try and match um, different coloured blue blocks. And so they had a row of blocks here and a row of blocks here and they had to match the ones that were the same colour, the same shade of blue. The Russian speakers in this experiment were quicker than the English speakers. And so then they, they draw the conclusion is this supports the hypothesis that maybe because Russian native speakers are used to thinking about delineating dark blue from light blue, that they therefore actually have trained themselves to perceive differences in shades of blue better than English speakers do. So things like that seem to be going on. There seems to be some level of uh, ling you know our language affecting, at least filtering in some level, the, the, the way that we think. Now, there's another idea here. Um, 
Austrian philosopher uh, Wittgenstein um, has this famous quote. Germans all know this quote. Um, and a lot of people in the English-speaking world know this quote as well, which in German is, die Grenzen meiner Sprache sind die Grenzen meiner Welt, or in English, the limits of my language are the limits of my world. This is an interesting one because maybe he's kind of come up with Sapir Whorf before Sapir and Whorf did. Um, people argue about exactly what it means by this. A lot of people will tell you that's not what he meant. Uh, and then they'll argue about, no, it's all about like talking about how what you are able to, well, I mean, maybe that is when people say, well, what he means by this is that you can only describe what you have words for. Uh, but then is that a case of, did he did he mean that, you know, that your language is actually restricting what you're able to perceive? Or is it just a case of we need to talk about this, therefore we need to make new words to talk about this and so on? But that was an idea he came up with. The whole idea of, of linguistic determinism and so on has been popular in fiction as well. For example, uh, George Orwell in the book 1984 had the concept of newspeak. So Big Brother is watching you uh, and you had the thought police making sure that you were thinking in the correct way for the, the government in 1984. And part of their control mechanism was that they created a new version of English called newspeak. And newspeak was deliberately extremely restricted. And the idea was that they force everyone to speak newspeak. They force everyone to speak this incredibly restricted a subset of English that would then restrict their thought and stop them from having thoughts that were not um, not okay to the government. People bring up 1984 all the time, often when they're talking about political language and things like that. And so, you know, Orwell, whether he was right or wrong about how how to what extent this could work, Orwell had a lot of interesting ideas about language, which may or may not have been correct, but whether or not he was right uh, about how it would work, the whole concept of it, and the concept of Newspeak and his ideas on linguistic determinism uh, have had a, an enormous impact on the way people talk about political language. Another thing you could check out if you have time, maybe over the summer holidays, is the movie Arrival. Um, I haven't seen it myself, but it's one that people talk about. I've read a, a fair bit about it, um, even though I haven't seen it. Um, see, it's got Amy Adams in it. Uh, for example, Forrest Whitaker. Um, and it's basically a movie about... Uh, an alien, like an alien uh, invasion of Earth or like aliens making contact with Earth. And then uh, the humans trying to communicate with them. And there's a very there's a very sort of deep vein of, of ling linguistic determinism sort of going on through the way that they approach the language in it. Anyway, hopefully that was interesting. This video has ended up way longer than I wanted it to be, but you're probably used to me waffling on anyway. Um, hopefully some of that was interesting or useful to you and we will come back and talk more about this later on. That's all from me today. Thanks.